Thank you, Dennis. Good afternoon. Um, I really have no idea how to, how to start this um, because what I want to talk about is very different from what Philip was talking about. Philip is talking, was talking about the way large structures are organized to oppress us. I really want to talk about how little teeny things uh, in our lives oppress us in an identical kind of a way and try to deprive us of the life of being a real human being. And, and, the, and the problem for me is where do I start this story? Because um, in, in a lot of ways this story doesn't start until 1967 when I moved to uh, Worcester, Massachusetts to go to Clark University where I got my PhD uh, and, and encountered cartography. Um, somehow I went through an undergraduate program at Western Reserve University um, without having to take a cartography course. It was required for the major, but since I was actually majoring in English, I didn't have to worry about that. So I, I actually bought the little kit, um, compasses, uh, ruling pens. Uh, this was in the days when cartography was entirely done by hand in ink on vellum. Um, and uh, anyway, I bought the kit, but I never took the course. When I got to graduate school, they insisted that I had to take a cartography course. And uh, it was the same thing, ruling pens, ink on vellum, um, drawing the silliest kinds of maps. We actually did a, a world projection um, by hand. Uh, it was cartography as it used to be done back in the old days. And um, as I said earlier, when I, when I ended up in this class and, and worked my way through it, it was like, this is the stupidest thing that I have ever encountered. This cannot be how human beings make maps of their world. I, I didn't understand at the time what was going on in the class, why the class was structured the way that it was. It was taught by George McCleary, who is without question the best teacher I've ever had. And he himself was a student of Arthur Robinson, who wrote that textbook. I, what's it called? Principles of Cartography? It's the dominant textbook in the English-speaking world in the second half of the 20th century for cartography. Um, so I'm, in some sense, the grandson of Arthur H. Robinson, author of, it can't be Principles of Cartography, but anyhow. Um, and, and from that time forward, I began this, this real antagonistic relationship with cartography. I took four cartography classes at Clark. I took the advanced cartography class and I took two seminars. Um, and uh, the deeper I got into it, the more frustrated I felt and the angrier I felt. At the same time that I was doing that, I was engaged in other kinds of mapping projects. Um, we had to read uh, Kevin Lynch's Image of the City, um, which was sort of the beginning of the mental maps movement. He had gone out and collected mental maps from residents in Boston and Jersey City and LA, asked them to draw their cities and compared them and, and came up with interesting kinds of, oh, they were really stupid ideas about what to do about cities based on these, these mental maps. But what he spawned was the mental maps movement, going out and asking people to draw maps of their world in various kinds of ways, which is what I proceeded to do for my master's thesis and my doctoral dissertation. Um, I asked kids, teenagers usually, to draw maps of San Cristobal de las Casas in the state of Chiapas in southern Mexico for my master's thesis, and a group of American tourists uh, visiting Europe for the first time um, for my doctoral dissertation. Both of those, by the way, are online on my website. And the dissertation was notorious at the time. It was called, I don't want to, but I will. We printed 200 copies of it. We sold it out within the year. Um, <laughs> it made me a notorious item in any event. Um, but I really didn't care. And I did anyway. Um, because not only cartography, but the whole educational system, the whole structure of the, of the master's program and the PhD program, these things just seemed increasingly to me to be prisons, to ways to 
lock us up or try to lock us up in some kind of small jail. Um, anyhow, Kevin Lynch, Image of the City, I thought, you know what? I can do this kind of thing for my own. I can draw these maps. I don't have to go out and collect them from other people. I can make them myself. And it was an interesting experience that I'd had um, when I was in the, I don't know how grades work here, but this was the second half of the sixth grade. I moved from a housing project in downtown Cleveland to Cleveland Heights, um, a radical shift. And we, went, we moved, the three boys, me, my, my, me and my two brothers, moved in the back of the van. They closed the door in the van. They drove us to this new place. We just wanted to be in the back of the van. They drove us to the new place, opened the door, we came out, and here was this new world. And one of the things that had, had grown increasingly interesting to me was how I had managed to turn that expanse of sidewalk and snow and so forth into the world that I lived in for the next nine years, um, which I came to know intimately. How did that map of that space grow in my head? And here I was, this first year graduate student at Clark, taking this odious cartography course. And meanwhile, I'm drawing these maps of Cleveland Heights. I'm trying to, re I'm trying to recover the first day, what, what I knew on the first day, and what I knew after I learned the route to school, and, what I, and how gradually I was able to increase the area that I was familiar with. So I'm drawing all these maps. That project just fell by the wayside until, like, I guess three or four, five years ago, maybe. Um, two things happened. In the end, one of them was this uh, crazy English publishing company um, produced this collection of 18, 16, I guess 16 booklets by me and Jeff Dyer and uh, Elifer Oleonison and so forth maps, about maps important in their lives. And I told them about this experience that I'd had drawing these maps of my neighborhood and they wanted to do it. And so those were finally published, these little sketches that I made in 1967, 1968. Uh, and they look like sketches. And I like those maps. Those are terrific maps. Um, so at the same time that I was learning how to make a map officially, I was making these other kind of sketch maps at the same time. And those sketch maps were not the first maps that I'd drawn. I'd been drawing maps since I was, I don't know, six or seven, very young. I was exposed to maps kind of early. They show up in all kinds of kids' picture books. Of course they're in picture books. And then they show up in like Winnie the Pooh, the Hundred Acre Wood map, and they show up in The Hobbit. The Hobbit was, for me, an incredible book. I discovered my grandfather's attic. It was a beautiful first edition, and it had those end papers on the front paper and the back. I love those maps. I love the way he drew those mountains. I love the way he drew smog flying over the lonely mountain. I was completely seduced by these kinds of images, and I, so I, I was drawing these too, but most of those were long since thrown away. So I had this long history with maps of drawing them with my hands, and then I was taking this cartography class and being asked to do it with quill pens, and I, the, fortunately, that was probably the last year they taught cartography that way at Clark, because what was happening was the, photo revolution was taking over and very shortly the computer revolution would begin to move in and we began making computer maps and I don't who, who makes maps with pens anymore probably a lot of people but anyhow my engagement with um, this whole mandatory way of thinking about map making came to a head for me in 1972. I just finished my PhD. I was, I had been promised a postdoctoral fellowship that didn't materialize. And in the end of August, they found me a job teaching in a local high school. Um, it was an experimental part of that high school, but it was a local high school. And I was thinking, what am I gonna do as a, as a geographer? So I began to put together a, um, a research program that I was to call the Cartography of Reality. 
And in fact, in 1972, I wrote this first paper called The Cartography of Reality. Um, I subsequently wrote a second paper called The Geometry of Ecstasy, and subsequently a third paper, which I might read to you, called um, What Colors the Sky? There's a fourth paper, a fifth is sketched out in my head, a sixth is out there, and I've always imagined this is going to be a book on the cartography of reality. And, and what reality means in this case is the real world that each of us ha inhabits individually, not the imaginary world that shows up on official maps. It's the real world. And my experience of the real world was that it didn't have a lot to do with the world that was shared with everybody else. Maybe shared with a couple of people, maybe some parts that were shared with a few more, but by and large, this world that I lived in that was real to me, that is real to me, seemed to be only real to me. And the more I thought about this, the more it seemed to me to be true that reality is an experience that we can have individually. We can't really share that, that real world with each other. We can share versions of that real world, distillations that are shrunk down in various and sundry ways to be more palatable for exchange with others. So I'm going to start with the, uh, what pa the order of the papers were to be read in was What Color is the Sky, The Cartography of Reality, The Geometry of Ecstasy. And I'm going to start by reading to you from that first paper. It must have been kindergarten, but perhaps it was the first grade. And though I don't remember which, the room burns still in my imagination with holographic palpability. I can still reach out and touch the walls of the dark and narrow cloakroom where we hung our coats and stood our boots. I can still deambulate the room's arrays of things to do. Here are the blocks and jigsaw puzzles. There are the teeny chairs and tables. I can still see the light streaming through the mammoth windows and I can still feel the fat crayons in my fingers working the wax onto the surface of the cheap white paper. What am I drawing? A line of trucks being filled with dirt? A string of coal cars moving past the projects? Our apartment surrounded by flowers? Again, I disremember, though again I recall with an almost visionary clarity the looming figure of the teacher, my resistance as her hand pulls the crayon from my fingers her admonition that the sky is blue, not green. I have heard the gentle voice of that savagery in all the intervening years. And I still do. Um, you know, when you're a little kid, you're five years old, and you're in kindergarten, and, and, you're, and you're reprimanded that way by having the crayon pulled out of your fingers by the teacher. Um, you don't forget things like that. And, and to my mind, this is where the structures of repression um, really, really begin. What color is the sky? Yesterday evening, it rained so hard, we thought we wouldn't be able to eat out on the porch. But the clouds moved off, and we did. When we sat down, the light was nacreous, as it is so often a little while after a summer's rain. But as we ate, the yard filled with the light of liquid yellow that cast no shadows as if the shrubs and grasses were themselves refulgent. Through the trees we watched the sky bloom jonquil and crocus until we couldn't stand it any longer, and we got up and wandered out into the street. Above us the whole wide sky was smoothly lutescent, though soon enough it sprouted flax and maize and saffron and straw, permitting hues of yellow citron and sulfur and lemon and chrome before slipping through a yellow matter to a matter orange and then more rapidly through tangerine and apricot to copper and bronze. And then, when did it happen? There were scintillas of stars in a cerulean sky that slid into cobalt as we strolled back to the porch for dessert. What color is the sky? It is different for every viewer, for every place and every time of day, for every season and every kind of weather, and at any instant, it is as elusive and evanescent as human love. This is not to say that the sky has no color, or that this color is not real, but rather that its reality is a matter of convergent circumstances of eyes and brains, air quality and atmospheric scattering, direction of glance and position of sun. It is not necessarily, regularly, even usually blue, 
notwithstanding the evidence of the uniformly blue roofs young kids nail above their drawings, the evidence of the wild blue yonder, out of the blue, the blue serene, the evidence of blue skies smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see. I collected at this point um, probably a thousand, well it was actually four, two or three years later, I'd collected a thousand um, drawings from North Carolina children from the mountains all the way to the coast, coastal plain, um, all kinds of kids, and almost invariably, like 97% of the time, there was this blue, almost inch thick, maybe not that thick, maybe a little thicker, blue line running across the top of their page. You know, it's, it's like the sky is blue. And yet, you know, it's not. This blue of drawings, poems, and songs of the piercing skies of medieval miniatures, Eastern Airlines advertisements and Chamber of Commerce brochures, of vacation dreams and Mediterranean summers, is a normative standard admired and desired, but infrequently encountered in most of our lives. Consider, on any given day, and varying with the conditions of the atmosphere, 33 to 35 percent of the Earth's surface is submerged in night. 20 to 25 percent is covered by a broad, multicolored, penumbral twilight. And 42 to 45 percent is bathed in daylight. Since under the best of conditions, only a portion of the twilight sky is blue, the sky can be blue no more than half the time. Of this half, the sky is not blue when it's overcast or raining, snowing or misty, hazy or foggy. The sky is often white, often the yellow of old paper during humid, dusty summers, except perhaps at twilight. And it is always white under cirrus clouds, however thin. After falls of snow, the sky is often green, and in regions of heavy industrialization or heavy traffic, the sky is gray even when cloudless, sometimes red or orange, as near the steel mills in Cleveland where my teacher told me the sky was blue. Even blue skies are usually cream and butter near the sun and along the horizon and run elsewhere from the milkiest of washed out blues to blue black and purple. What color is the sky? Normatively, it is blue. This is the standard against which other colors are assessed, and this is true in more than the sense we like to think of the sky as normally blue and of other colors as, de as deviations. It's true in the sense that, in exceptionally clear weather, the spectral brightness distribution of the daytime sky differs from the solar spectrum in a general way by a factor proportional to alpha raised to the minus fourth as would have been expected from the Raleigh theory. However, even in the most favorable cases, there are considerable departures from this behavior. Thus, blue sort of is the color of the sky, a nice dry sky in the middle of the desert or thousands of feet in the air. But these are not the skies most of us inhabit. The sky would be blue, should be blue, if only it were a nice theory instead of the messy living and breathing reality it happens to be. I call this should be, would be, blue, imaginary, in the sense that it's ideal for our theories, for our dreams, both because we want the world to work this simple way and because it is chased like other dreams, the scientists looking for clear, clean skies in which to make their measurements, the rich summering in Maine, wintering in California, retiring to Acapulco. Counterpoised against this normative imaginary standard are the veritable colors of the real sky of our daily living and dying, walking, waking and going to bed. These endless divisions of the spectrum are real in the sense that they can be perceived, apprehended, encountered, realized, seen by anyone who goes out into the sky and looks at it and pays attention to what's out there. And I know the sky's been a little blue today in, in Berlin, but mostly it hasn't. It's been pretty gray, actually. 
Between these poles of real, unique individual experience and imaginary, generalized social tokens intervene a number of intermediary positions like so many undulations on a Piedmont highway, more or less real, more or less imaginary, and varying with time and history, with the size and character of reference groups, with the needs and intentions of individuals and societies. The 18th century loved the yellow sky it saw through the narrow range of tones of its curved, clawed glass. Beardstadt and company only looked at America under flaming sunsets. White skies lie flat behind the 20th century novels set around the Mediterranean, Colette, Giono, Durrell, endless others. And everyone who has lived there knows the unending uniformity of the gray skies of the Massachusetts winter. Each of us participates in many such conventions. Kids share one sky, adults another. The sky of foresters is not that of Hewlett Oilers. The sky of farmers is not that of high school physics teachers. I call the color of these skies ephemeral, sometimes things, because they are matters of shifting consensus, whether momentarily rested by an individual from the welter of his unrelenting experiences or broadly shared by larger groups for longer periods of time. Though the larger the group, the less rapidly or likely the color is to change and the less likely it is to be real, to conform, that is, to the experiences of any single person. Thus, for each of us, there's a range, I will not call it a continuum, of sky colors, which runs from the evanescent fleeting realities of our individual experiences, color succeeding color with the transience and rapidity of an actual day in any of our lives, to the implacable rigidity of the imaginary standard, consensual to the group of all groups, to the group of all of us taken together and evolving if that is the word, with all the speed of a glacier cutting a valley in recent times. In a way, it is like the model of the Mayan calendar. Whoa. And there it is. In a way, it's like the model of the Mayan calendar. If I can find where I was when I said that. In which the enmeshed cogs of the civil and sacred years seem to drive the larger and more slowly revolving wheel of the 52-year calendar round only with many more intervening toothed wheels representing the ephemera of the numerous overlapping consensus groups. And as it is impossible with the Mayan calendar to say which drives which, the years, the days, or the days, the years, so here it is sometimes difficult to say if it is real individual experience that informs the insubstantial ideologies of culture, or if it's the other way around, the ideologies of culture supplanting, taking the place of experienced self. At some time, in some place, though I know not where, nor when, nor even if, there might have been an easy generative tension between the real and the imaginary, the personal and the social, each scout to the other in a free and fruitful reciprocity, playing across the numberless levels in the hierarchy of construction in a continuously life-enhancing fashion. But this is neither there nor then, but here and now, and in the cement of social institutions perennially threatening to solidify, it is necessary to insist on the reality of individual experience, to posit and proclaim it, lest it be denied, denigrated, irremediably destroyed. It is necessary not merely for the sake of each of us, but all of our sakes together, to recover the green crayon, to work its wax into the surface of that cheap white paper, to insist on the reality of the greenness of the sky and to insist on the reality of our individual experiences of space and time. For just as there exists a range of construals or constructions of the color of the sky, so there exists a range of construals or constructions of the nature of space and time. And just as close attention to the reality of our experience of the sky reveals not simply the essential reality of its polychromatic constitution, but the existence of levels of construal of increasing generality and decreasing conformity to individual experience, so close attention to our own individual experiences of space and time will reveal not only their essential reality, but the existence of levels of construal running from the merely ephemeral to the completely imaginary. Few of the imaginary ideologies of culture are as important as those of space and time, and few so strongly buffet and batter the living reality of our experience. 
Few realities are so scorned, so doubted, so trammeled, so frequently, loudly, and jeeringly called into question as those of space and time. Do I have a long way to go? I am told it is short, and yardsticks or general experience of others are produced in witness. Have I come from the north? No sooner do I say so than I am informed that it was from the southeast, and compasses are danced before my eyes. Have I waited two hours? Dare I grouse contradicting clocks are pushed in my face, or I am told that no one else has complained, and this is evidence of the space of time. Has my walk to school varied in length, stretching slowly, fluidly, like chewing gum? That's a quote from, from Lawrence Durrell. It is promptly demonstrated that a distance is a distance is a distance is a distance, and by definition, invariable. Did I observe that our trip was longer than a second, the second longer than a third, but the third longer than the first? Instantly, this is decried as an impossibility, and should I demand to know what observations make it so, I am snidely informed, just as the crayon was pulled from my resisting fingers, that it is not a matter of observation, but of logic, that intransitive metric relations are physical absurdities. Absurd they may well be, but isn't it a great deal more absurd to expect my experiences conform to his or hers or theirs or yours, to a logic whose relevance is utterly open to question? Isn't it a great deal sillier to try and circumscribe my experienced reality with yours or with the analytic a priori of a by definition? Isn't it almost insane to presuppose that my experience should have anything to do with that of a yardstick, a compass, a clock? I am not a clock. I am not a bunch of geared wheels driven by the pressure of a coiled spring of steel. I am a person, not a length of wood marked off into 36 equal segments, each about the width of my thumb. What has the experience of these things, these other people, to do with mine? Why does the world, parents, teachers, friends, insist on squashing my experience into conformality, not with their own individual experience, but with that of them taken as a whole, with that of yardsticks and clocks? And if it is objected that there is no reason not to, that there is no reason not to suppose that my experience is very like theirs, then I must respond that, given the unexplored nature of individual realities, there is no reason to suppose them similar either, no reason beforehand to posit similar spaces for dissimilar things, similar times for dissimilar people. And in fact, there are profound historical reasons for doubting, not that different things inhabit different spaces, for the local space-time of human experience is demonstrably not that of galaxies and subatomic particles, but that the standard notions of space and time are capable of subsuming the actuality of anyone's experience, anything's experience, yardstick, clock, or human being. For the standard notions against which past individual experience was measured and found wanting have died, changed, or evolved more slowly than the motion of the Mayan calendar round into newer forms. And if in the past there has been no reason to impute in un unutterable infallibility to the standard notions of space and time, there is certainly no reason to do so now. We have reached no final unalterable end, no pinnacle of truth and knowledge. The search, the unending quest continues as it always has and will, and this is reason enough to insist on the significance and reality of our individual experience of space and time, if only perhaps to keep the cement of our social institutions from finally hardening, to keep alive the tension between the real and the imaginary, the personal and the social. None of this, of course, is meant to disparage the art stick, the clock, or the compass or the definitions of axiomatic systems and the rules they use to derive one remark from another. All these are fine, occasionally wonderful, sometimes marvelous things, but their nature and experience are not my nature and experience, nor are they a priori homologous to or in any way analogous to my nature and experience, to the reality of my nature and experience, to my reality, to the only reality to which I have access. They are not, in a word, real, but belong and pertain to that imaginary social world of blue skies and common sense, that standard world of cultural ideologues to which I contribute and of which I share, but which is not real, 
to me or any other. Pick up a map of the standard world. Of what is it? Of the experience of people or yardsticks? Look at that road. How was its length determined? Did someone walk along it and say how long it was? Or was a yardstick laid down on the ground and another and another and then their number counted? A yardstick? No. The length of a yardstick is made too variable by changes in heat and humidity, as is that of chains of metal, rods of regal wood bound in bell metal. Nothing less than a glass tube trussed in a wooden case will do. Now lay that out along the ground until the distance is consumed. And what is the result? Wittgenstein said, consider a tribe of people who measure length of fields by striding along and counting their steps. If different results are obtained for the same field, they think nothing of it, even if payment depends on the results of the counting. If you come along and say you have a better method which uses a tape measure, they might be quite uninterested. They might say, what a queer method that uses troublesome gadgets and always gets the same result. Our method is much better. The notion of a more accurate measurement does not enter into their lives. And so the notion of the real length does not enter either. If we say they must have a notion of a real length, this is only because we imagine a more complicated life in which one method of measuring is preferred to another, but that is not their life. Nor is it mine or anyone else's individually, though it defines us as a collective social people. Our existence is pervaded by the real length. The question, but how long is it really, follows any assertion about a length the slightest bit at variance with an imagined standard. But what can the question possibly mean? That things are real only if they don't vary? Is this the peculiar residue of platonic idealism behind the notion that the sky is really blue? Or does it mean that a tape measure is more real? Or somehow more attuned to the reality of lengths than a person? Either answer is incredible, but both are true in the imaginary standard world. Witness Jay Bronowski, and this is Jay Bronowski. Time passes slower for the traveler than it does for the bystander. That is a necessary consequence of the two axioms of relativity being taken together. I must emphasize that here time is a concrete, a succession of physical events as visible as the sweep of the hand of a clock. We are not discussing some intangible feeling, the impatience of a traveler who wants to get on and to whom everything seems to be moving too slow. The passage of time in relativity is measured by physical processes, the rotation of clock wheels, the movement of atoms, the decay of unstable particles. What is the point he's trying to make? Not about the rather obvious fact of time passing differently for the traveler than the bystander, but about clocks being concrete physical processes and people, and especially their feelings, being something else, being intangible. But who can touch who can palpate a decaying particle or a moving atom? And who can not touch a person? Or is the point more generally that people's feelings are elusive or incapable of being perceived? And if this is the point, it makes hash of a sense for nothing is more incapable of being perceived than the sweep of the hour hand and nothing more capable of being perceived than a feeling like impatience, not only by the impatient person, but by any bystander who pays attention to his pacings, fidgetings, and frequent glances up and down the station platform. A person is as much a physical process as a decaying particle, as much a physical process as a clock, and a person's feelings are as legitimate physical states of that process as are the different positions of the hands of a clock or the different status, states of a decaying particle. A person and his feelings are concrete, successions of physical events as visible, as tangible, as palpable as anything in the world. Well, this goes on. <laughs> and <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to get to is the problem of portraying an intransitive relationship. That is to say, one in which A is longer than B and B is longer than C, but C is longer than A. The problem for the cartographer of reality is how to take these experiences and put them on paper. Not how to take these experiences and think about them, but how to put them on paper, how to make them mappable. Um, the, the second image uh, shows 
the same kind of thing, but imagine it in a kind of different way, where the car has a much more difficult time going up C than it does going along A or going down B, and therefore C is, in some sense, longer than A and longer than B. I'm not sure that these are either um, very successful solutions to the problem of representing an intransitive relationship. And had this been a workshop, I would have been asking you now to try and do that, to try and commit to paper the reality that if A is longer than B and B is longer than C, that C can nonetheless be longer than A. That's the problem the cartographer of reality proposes. The second chapter in the Cartographer Reality deals with the experience of an elementary school kid, first grader actually, raising his hand, unwillingly raising his hand because he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. But he really, really, really has to go to the bathroom. Finally, he raises his hand. But you know, it's, it's really probably a little too late. He gets up, he's given permission to go to the bathroom. He gets up, he begins, he walks out of the room in some, in some uh, decorum, and then he realizes the hall going down to the stairs, that hall is just enormously long, and he races along that hall. The hall keeps getting longer and longer. He gets to the top of the stairs, and he goes, starts going down the stairs, and the stairs, my God, there are more stairs than you can possibly imagine goes down the next flight of stairs, there are more, eh. he gets to the bathroom, but damn, it's too late. He's pissed his pants. Okay, now what in the hell does he do? He's got this incredible stain that says, stupid kid, across his, uh, across his crotch, and he's got to return to the classroom. <laughs> and guess what? Those stairs are so short, and that hall is so non-existent that he's back in the classroom with his hand on the door before he can possibly imagine. Okay, he goes in, and guess what? Those kids don't, they don't snicker, they don't point, they don't say anything. What's wrong with these kids? Why aren't they making fun of me? Why aren't they mocking me? Well, he had dark pants on, and the stain wasn't really very noticeable. Uh, he got most of it into the, into the urinal in any case. Um, he creates this idea, seem to. He realizes that the only reason these kids aren't making fun of him is because he must not have been as long as he thought he was. Maybe it only seemed to be a really long trip going downstairs. Maybe, maybe the reality was coming upstairs and really short, although that may be a seam thing too. He goes through these experiences that he has in this elementary school classroom again and again and again. Totally different kinds of experiences. But he, he, he develops this notion of seam, and seam becomes a way for him to translate between his actual experience, that stupid hallway really, really was forever, and the reality of the kids not responding that way. And then he says, okay, the hall just seemed to be very long. It seemed to be taking forever to go down those stairs. It wasn't really. So this is where this difference between, between the, the real experience and the, and the non-real experience, the imaginary experience, comes from. His real experience was, I know you've been in situations like this. His real experience was that that hall was really, really long. Those stairs were really, really high. They, well, they didn't seem long. They were long. It was long. It, this is his actual, real experience. The imagination is that, uh-oh, I guess they just seem to be long. There really is only one length. It couldn't have been that long. And so, so as, as the kid grows older, he begins to construct this mechanism for relating between the real experiences that he actually has and, and the world. And so he begins to deny the nature of those real experiences. My question in, in the cartography reality is, is, is how would we represent on a piece of paper, well, that's another intransitive thing. Here's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. Oh no, how can this be happening? 
I've been sent to see the principal. This is all Calvin's fault. He's the one who got me into all this trouble. I'm so scared. What am I going to do? I think they made the hall to the principal's office this big on purpose. And what this does for me is confirm that my experience of that, of that endless hallway is not, is not some unique thing. It's something that's shared by other people. In this case, now maybe it's only people who grew up in northern Ohio because um, Watterson, who drew Calvin and Hobbes, well, he now lives in Cleveland Heights, where, where I ended up, in Cleveland. Uh, so maybe it's just a peculiarity for people who live in northern Ohio, but I don't think so. So the problem then for the cartographer of reality is how to, how to represent this. This is an example that I developed uh, these experiences, they just happen all the time. We had enough money, finally, to buy a rug for the living room. A six by eight foot rug. And um, we were really kind of happy. So we go to the store, we buy the rug, we bring it home, and Jesus fucking Christ, that thing has shrunk. It, it's, it's just this little, the little postage stamp on the floor of the living room. And then we had a, a, a visitor whose contact lens fell into the rug. It was a shag. You know how big that thing became as we try to look for that contact lens in that rug? That thing became as big as the Sahara Desert. Okay, so how do, how do you do this? We have this map of the rug, and we have different scales. We have a scale for, the use of the, for using this map with a bill of sale when it was six by eight feet. We have another one for the, the uh, point of purchase. We have the scale when it was first laid on the floor, and we have the scale during the search for the contact lens. So one way of representing these realities is simply to use different, different scales, different legends for them. And another way of representing that is like this, where instead of putting numbers on the scale, you leave it open so it can be any scale which is what it really is. It really is any scale. The rug shrinks and grows, you know, depending on, on what's going on. It's, it's absolutely not something that's constant and fixed. Okay, this is a trip from home to work. Uh, my experience has always been that the trip from home to work is, is a varying thing. The trip to work is always shorter than the trip home. You want to get home, the distance just spreads out in front of you. You don't particularly want to go to work, you're, you're there before you can, before you can think. Um, and this is a way of trying to solve that problem, in which, as you can see, um, we use uh, the same, just one, one stretch of uh, line, but we have different scales. We have a scale from going from Lemonster to Worcester, which is from home to, home to work, and we have another scale from going from Lemonster to Worcester home, and um, that's the other direction. And depending on the direction that you go, um, obviously you're gonna use a different scale. Now here's another way of doing that. In this case, we've actually increased the length of the road. Now, can you imagine drawing uh, lines like this on maps to represent the reality of experience? This is the problem with the cartography of reality at this point. Very few maps have been constructed. Even though solutions to individual problems have been entertained, very few maps have been constructed because you're going to have to construct them with things like this. The space in the, uh, in the middle there, that is not um, anything but an artifact of the map. And if you think about actual maps that we use in, like uh, Phillips' maps that he was using, you, you can see there are many, many, many ways of representing the world. Similarly here, there are many, many ways of representing the fact that one distance is longer than the other distance, even though it's between the same two points. These solutions came up from a group of students that I, I was teaching at Clark in 1973. Um, they had various and sundry ingenious ideas about how to represent. This is a, a version of the same kind of experience going from home to work, and you go one direction, and you're, since you're going to cross past Crawford's gas station in both directions, 
um, you will see it there twice in the map. So the map in this case, the artifact of the map will be that you have to have features shown more than one time. They're going to appear twice. In this case, uh, Crawford's. And you see the distance is different once again. Work to home, home to work. This one is obviously the same thing, but done in a Moivis strip. Um, I'm not sure that anything is gained by putting it on this thing. It certainly would make for an interesting map if you try to put a map on that kind of a surface. Okay, now here's another way of doing it. Instead of, instead of insisting that the uh, destinations were identical, we just multiply the destinations. So depending on whether you're going from home to work or work to home, you have different homes and different works. They're located in different locations. So suddenly the map is going to pro proliferate um, destinations and destination points. Here's another way of doing that. Home is now represented as a, as a cloud of possibilities. Work is represented as a cloud of possibilities. And here was my attempt to do a map of, um, from Worcester to Boston to Providence by cutting up a map, uh, cutting up a couple of maps, looks like cutting up three or four maps actually, and gluing them together to give that same kind of idea as, as we have here, where Boston could be work, let's say, that becomes uh, that cloud of dots, and home is that cloud, and so same thing here. Worcester is a cloud of dots, Boston is a cloud of dots, Providence is a cloud of dots, and once again, the, the, the strange things that materialize, like uh, the Boston Harbor suddenly materializing inside Boston, that once again is just an artifact of the map. It's not, it's not some weird, impossible, improbable thing. It's an artifact of the map like, you know, the North Pole is a point, except on a Mercator projection, it's a line of infinite length. So. Is the pole a line of infinite length, or is the pole a dot? That's the same thing we have here. Um, same thing, but with the color taken away. OK, this is a problem that um, a kid raised. The problem is you, you're sledding snow. You've got a sled. You go up the hill. You come down the hill. You go up the hill another time. You go down the hill another time. You go up the hill another the going up the hill is always a much longer, farther, distant experience than going down the hill. Going up the hill the second time, it's even longer. Coming down the second time, it's probably shorter than it was before. Going up the third time, it's longer still, etc. And so what we've done here is we've used different contour lines, one for descent and one for ascent. And that's the left. And then on the right, we've got sequential ascents and sequential descents. So the question is, how do you represent the hill? And the hill is changing in height as you go up and down it. That's the reality. I know, I know you've sledded, but uh, well, I hope you've sledded. This is the way another kid represented that. He said, OK, we're going to go past these pine trees. You're going up the hill, the pine trees are wide. You're going down the hill, the pine trees get squashed together. Next time you go up the hill, the pine trees are farther and farther, bigger and bigger. You go down the hill, they're closer together. The third time you go up, the trees are, it takes you a long time to go past those trees. Going down the hill, almost instantaneous. Now, that's not a cartographic representation, but it's the same thing. Okay, now we move on to um, the problem of the uh, poor student. And I was talking about this with somebody earlier today, taking um, geometry. We were actually talking about taking Latin, and that's how this paper starts. Why did I take five years of Latin? Well, we did it for the mind training. You could take French, too. You didn't have to take Latin. You could take French or Latin. Um, I took Latin. All the cool kids took Latin because... You know, if you had what it took, if you had the brains, you took Latin. If you just wanted to chatter, you took French. Um, so the same reason we took geometry. Not, not just took geometry, but the same reason we took geometry and learned it the way we did, from a small handful of axioms deducing this incredible quantity of theorems, utilizing a kind of logic. Um, 
that was the mind training. Now, geometry, you, you don't have to go through those proof things to learn the truths of geometry. You could just learn the axioms, just like you learn how to spell. You know, you don't, there's no reason for you to prove that opposing angles, uh, two parallel lines slashed by line, the opposing angles, you don't have to prove that. Why would you have to prove that? You could just learn that, that, that in cases like that, those opposing angles are equal. You could learn it as a fact. You could learn all of geometry that it takes a year to go through in curriculums nowadays. You could do it in, you could do it in, in six weeks. Why do we have to do it the way we do it? Well, because your mind needs to be trained. And the way to train your mind is not to solve problems, but to solve problems the way Plato solved problems. Plato's problem was Plato hated labor. He hated bodies. He distrusted bodies. He did everything he possibly could to enter the imaginary world. He created the imaginary world in the West. These problems that we're going to solve here are problems that are raised in, um, in, in, in what I call the geometry of ecstasy. So in this case, when you're driving home, the sun is always in your eyes. And, the, and it doesn't matter what direction you're going. The sun is always in your eyes. And this is one way of possibly representing that. Just a lot of suns. Well, this is interesting. I've been pressing this button and going down, and now I'm, let's try this one. And this is the, the winter situation. No matter which direction you go, the wind is always in your face. Again, I'm not sure this is a cartographic solution, but I'm not sure what the cartographic solution looks like. Here, here the um, sun is always in the sky, in the, it obviously showing multiple suns. We just multiply the number of suns in this case. Let me go on to this one here. Okay, and here is a situation where the sun encircling the horizon it rises in the morning because the sun is always, this is a different ways of showing the same thing. The sun's always in your eyes. The sun rises, it circles, it rises, it rises to a point, it comes down, it comes down at the bottom. So if the sun is not overhead, it's always in your face. Again, um, is this a cartographic solution? I'm not sure that fooling around with the, the numbers of suns is the way to solve cartographic problems, but it might be. This is the same situation, but using contour lines to, uh, for hill elevation. This is shaded relief. If the sun is on all those sides, you have different ways of showing that by, by varying the shaded relief on a hill, hill form. Now, this is a real situation, of course. This is an azimuthal polar projection, and of course, all those compasses are going to point north, and notice they're pointing north in different directions. Okay, now this is a kind of artifact that shows up on a map, a regular, standard, ordinary, imaginary map. Um, if things like this can show up on imaginary maps, things like this can show up on real maps, too. Well, this is the, the puzzle that uh, is given to kids. If you're, where, where are you if you have four windows in a room and outside every window you can see a penguin? Or vice versa, if you're at the South Pole and you're standing in a room, what's the animal outside the, uh, outside the windows? These polar situations are really really do serious, serious injustice to uh, the, the way we think about standard maps as presenting a world that is, that is sane. Here's a problem. Lake Erie uh, is to the north of Cleveland. Everybody knows this, unless you live in Cleveland Heights. If you're in Cleveland Heights, you can clearly see the sun setting over Lake Erie. And if the sun sets in the west, clearly the lake is to the west of Cleveland. The imaginary solution to this problem is to note that the, the shoreline of Cleveland is running southwest, northeast. But the real situation, the confusing situation, is that you're really not sure about that. I remember when my um, now ex-wife moved to Cleveland with me and um, went to work downtown from Cleveland Heights she never was able to orient herself appropriately because she assumed the lake was north of Cleveland. 
and assuming that wrecked a, a kind of havoc with instructions she'd get from people. Just go west, you know, and, and so to go west for her, she would have to go southwest because west was clearly not going to take her into the lake because the lake was north of Cleveland. One way of dealing with this problem would be to use a compass in which you had a range of north and a range of west. Instead of imagining that the lake was the problem, all we have to imagine is that north and west are problems. So we start thinking about directions instead of points. We think about them as ranges. So west becomes a, a broad range, and you can see what west is in this case, and you can see what north is in this case. And of course, the compass would always have to have similar kinds of things for east and south. And another way of resolving that same problem Yet another one. Here's our compass with all, the, all of the directions. How are you going to map, how are you going to draw a map when, when directions are, are, are wandering around like this? This is a problem about where the airport is in Worcester, Massachusetts. And the same thing arises. The airport is to the north of Worcester. No, it's to the west of Worcester. And in order to deal with this conflict, which shows up constantly when you're living in Worcester, you have to have a compass like I've shown down there. Or, when you draw the airport, you draw the airport in such a way that it really is to the north and west of Worcester. In other words, the airport grows in size in order to accommodate the reality that the airport's to the north of Worcester and the airport's to the west of Worcester. Or, you multiply the number of airports so they can all be north and west of Worcester, and then you have to multiply the number of roads going up there. This is what happens in the cartographer reality. If you try to imagine how you're going to make a standard map of the real world, the problems are terrific. Here's a problem that shows up as well. There are two streets in Worcester, Chandler and, and Piedmont. They run parallel to each other. They both cross Main Street at right angles, and they cross each other at right angles. Okay, now, people have a lot of trouble with this because Main Street, I mean, uh, Piedmont Street seems to be straight and Chandler Street seems to be straight. How can they cross each other at right angles and cross Main Street at right angles? The only way they can work this out is to create a mental switch in their head where somehow, as they're, as they're moving along these things, a switch takes place that allows the inevitable to happen, that they're going to cross each other at right angles, even though they know they can't. Or the interior angles of a triangle are not 180 degrees. That's another solution to this problem. These are different ways of trying to imagine how you would draw a map that would include those things. And this is a map of Worcester in which you see that large white space down at the bottom of the page there. That's where I've cut the map in order to make the reality of, of uh, Piedmont and, and Chandler crossing Main Street at right angles and crossing each other at right angles work. You just cut this big hole in the map and pull the map out apart. So that white space in the middle of the map you know, it's another artifact of a map. In this case, I'm saying that's the form ecstasy takes when you, uh, when you try to map it. Okay, obviously these are all radically flawed, imperfect, Im completely partial solutions to any of these problems. And that's the problem that this project of the cartography reality is trying to grapple with. How to imagine making a map of the world that we actually really experience that is also a map. Because if we can't do this, we've reached the limits of what maps can show us in a very, very serious kind of a way. Let me point out that, that the experiences that underwrite this thing are all conflicts with authority. It's, it's the teacher insisting that the sky is blue. It's the kids not responding to the kid when he's peed in his pants. It's the um, insistence on, on taking geometry and studying geometry as Plato studied geometry. In every one of these cases is a conflict between the body and a conflict between the body and the, and the social world that, that, that 
that it, that body is embedded in. There's a conflict between those things. I guess my argument is that all of the situations that Philip was describing in his presentations have their roots in these kinds of suppressions, in, in the suppression of the teacher telling the child that the sky has one color and that that color is blue, that those kinds of small, personal encounters are what underwrite all of the oppression, the inequality, the suppression, the brutality of the world that, that Philip was describing. This is where they begin. And, and, and what I'm trying to imagine is that what if we were able to map the worlds we really lived in? Could we break out of the worlds that Philip was describing? Could we actually walk through the duty-free shop without spending any money at all? And I, and I think we can. Anyhow, I've been working on this for a long time. I haven't solved it at all. Um, it's where I am now, though. Um, and I thank you for the patience you've shown in, in listening to this. Thanks. I have to tell you, I haven't slept in like 36 hours either, so. Any questions, responses, comments? I'm stunned. Well, all you can see is the crossing here at right angles. You can't see them where they're based down. They, they run down at the bottom. You can't see them where they're crossing Main Street. You can only see where they're crossing at right angles here. They're crossing right there. Yeah, it's about ripping maps up to make the maps really conform to our lives rather than obeying the maps and bowing down in front of them. That's what it's about, really. You know, I don't know who... No, it wasn't you. I guess in this little short comments we were asked, these little bios we were asked, I, I, I say something apparently like, um, I've been working on these, on wrestling with maps for 50 years, and I still can't stand them. I don't like the insistence that they have that they really know what the world looks like. That just drives me completely around the bend. And I've never been able to, like, oh, yes, that's the most beautiful map. You know how people always say, oh, I just love maps? You tell people you're involved with maps. That's what you always say, oh, I love maps. And, and you wonder, what in the hell are they talking about? <laughs> it, just, it just drives me completely around the bend. I've yet to meet somebody who, when I say something like I'm involved with maps, doesn't say that. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think they're wrong. I just think they're imaginary. I don't think they're wrong. I just think they're imaginary. You know, it's, it's not that the, it's not, there's no wrong in this thing. There's just a, there's just a range between the experience we have as individuals and, and that thing that shows up in the map. And there's a conflict between those two things. And, and I want that conflict to be acknowledged as a real thing, as opposed to the person who says, damn, that seemed like such a long way. And you look in the map and you discover it was this little short trip. Instead, instead of just putting the person's experience down, I want it to be acknowledged. Oh, man, I guess it was a long way. That road must have really stretched out. I mean, how do you explain the fact that sometimes it feels longer than it does at other times? You know, we internalize that. We make it a psychological issue. But what if it's not a psychological issue? Every map is individual. That's absolutely correct. So, so what cartography turns out to be is a generalizing tool for individual maps. Um, or something like that.
Uh, yeah, it, it's not entirely clear to me. As long as I've been thinking about this thing, it's not entirely clear to me. It's certainly not clear to me what maps want to be, you know, or what they can be. I mean, I, I think there's some pretty amazing maps in this room today. That map back there is just incredible. I mean, that's extraordinary. Um, but there are lots of really interesting maps here. But most maps are just dull as dishwater and, and constricting and narrowing and, of course, very helpful, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that at all. <laughs> Although, looking at the maps I looked at, I thought this place where I am now was a lot closer to my hotel than it turned out to be when we took that cab ride. I don't know where anything is, you know, it's, it's... I guess I want the world to be filled with possibility and mystery. Um, you know, Philip said he was an anarchist. I've been an anarchist all my life, but I've also been a surrealist. And I think that, you know, Andre Breton and Max Ernst and René Magritte, you know, I think they had a handle on, on things that uh, Arthur H. Robinson, you know, n never did. Um, and he was a nice guy, but, you know, he's just, oh my God. Used to work for the CIA, if that's any, any clue. Anyhow. Okay. Thank you very much, Dennis.